cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, talk about meteorites and what we can, how we can study them to look at early solar system processes. And I am particularly focused on the Mercosur CM chondrite and whether or not it could have recorded the solar nebula magnetic field during impacts. So first, I'm just going to give a quick um, introduction to carbonaceous chondrites. So carbonaceous chondrites come from some of the oldest um, bodies in the solar system, which formed in the first few million years um, after the start of the solar system and are particularly undifferentiated and um, primitive. Now, their general structure is they have this kind of, if I turn on my pointer, have this kind of fine grain matrix. And then within this very porous matrix, they have these kind of non-porous chondrules set within them, which you can kind of see here. And the important thing for us is that they contain magnetic minerals, which means that they should be able to retain a magnetic remnant that was acquired during um, early on in the solar system. And we can use this to investigate solar system processes. And there's a lot of debate about how um, these carbonaceous chondrites acquire their magnetic remnants. So the main two fields that these carbonaceous chondrites could be recording are, well, well, the first is the nebula magnetic field. So this is an outer disk field that was associated with the collapse of the molecular cloud into the formation of the solar system. And it, in, it decreases with intensity with distance from the sun, and it also decreases with time. It's, um, it's better to be quite a low intensity between 0.1 and 10 microtesla. And the second type of magnetic field that was thought to be present in the early solar system is associated with these planetesimals, which are kind of like precursors to planets and bodies on the orders of about 500 kilometer size. And if these undergo differentiation, it's thought that they could have kind of convecting mantles or convecting cores and then produce um, dynamos in the same way that, or a similar way to how the Earth has a dynamo field. And these are expected to be in general larger intensity or higher intensity between like 0.5 and 150 microtesla. Now, there are lots of different processes that, um, lots of different processes about how carbonaceous chondrites could be recording these different fields. And these include things like during impacts or during aqueous alteration and the formation of magnetic minerals. Um, also during metamorphic heating, if these bodies were heated or if the rocks were heated above the curie temperatures, you could be um, recording magnetizations upon cooling. So the main uh, mechanism that I'm particularly focused on is whether or not um, or which meteorites could record the nebula magnetic field during impact. So precursors to these carbonaceous chondrites were um, kind of primitive chondrites that were had this particularly porous matrix, about 50 percent porosity. And when these would impact together um, or modeling has shown that when these impact at low velocities, you get large scale, um, you get pore space compaction within that matrix. And this releases a large amount of energy, and this can heat the matrix up to temperatures of 1000 Kelvin. But these temperature excursions are, are very short, they only last about 10 seconds, and that's because the non-porous chondrules absorb a lot of this heat and energy, which means that they're very short-lived. But during these high temperature heat excursions, magnetic minerals in the matrix could record a thermo remnant during cooling, back to kind of uh, um, temperatures in the nebula. So you can see kind of in this model how it reduces the pore space and so red is very porous and blue is non-porous and you can see that the porosity of the matrix has also decreased to what are kind of common chondritic or meteoritic um, porosities that we measure. And this has been suggested as a mechanism for the acquisition of magnetization in the CV chondrite Allende. So but we were we kind of turned our focus onto the Mercosur, which is a CM chondrite. So um, other studies have found that the magnetic and pyrotite are the main magnetic minerals. And this has been found by magnetic measurements and also using X-ray diffraction. And the kind of fabric analysis has shown that these minerals form during aqueous alteration and they've been dated at 2.4 million years post CAI, where CAI is um, kind of taken as the age of the solar system, which is when the first solids condensed, which were calcium aluminium intrusions. And also there's a, a fabric within the chondrules that's been seen in Mercosur, which has suggested that they've experienced these poor reducing impacts or a poor reducing impact. But then overall, the, the majority of Mercosur does have quite a low shock state, so it doesn't, hasn't experienced any high pressures. So this leads us on to the main question that we were asking, which is, is there any evidence for this impact induced TRM in the Mercosur CM chondrite? So the way we looked and um, the way that we did this is we did a paleomagnetic study. So this was to try and determine the field source of magnetization. And then we also did a magnetic fabric study. 
to determine whether or not there was any evidence of impacts. So we had about a four centimetre size um, piece of Mercosun, which we orientated and then broke into nine subsamples. Firstly, we did our direction analysis. So we AFD magnetized our nine subsamples. Um, we, we used AFD magnetization because the Mercosun has been shown to alter on heating to about 40, 40 degrees Celsius. And what we found in all of our samples was this high coercivity um, primary component of magnetization. You can see that um, we plotted these on an equal area plot to determine whether or not there was a coherent magnetization throughout the sample. And you can see there's quite a lot of scatter in our plot. And this was partly because the, um, the sample pieces were regularly shaped, so they weren't the easiest to orientate during measurements. But we can see that there is definitely a lot of clustering around here. So we did the Watson's test for randomness on our, on our samples, and we found that we can reject randomness with a 95% certainty. So what we show here is we have a coherent magnetization throughout the Mercosin sample. So we also made some paleo intensity estimates using two different non-heating methods. So we used the REM prime method and the Prysic method that um, Adrian spoke about earlier. And these both use the um, AFD magnetization spectra of the NRM and then also normalized to the to an AFD mag of the saturation isothermal um, magnetization. And we can see that these both give consistent or um, similar low values of paleo intensity. So we get paleo intensities of about 0.6 micro Tesla. And this is consistent with other studies of Mercosum. So we're interested in looking at this meteorite and interested if, if it's recorded a magnetic field at the start of the solar system and retain that signature to this day. So we want it to have carried this magnetic signal for over four billion years. So we want to look at the mineralogy and see what kind of magnetic carriers we have in, in Mercosum. So we did some um, EDX. Yes, on some um, SEM sample, and looking specifically at the matrix, and we found that we have magnetite grains and also sulfate grains present, which is what we were expecting. And we also did some low temperature measurements on the MPS at Imperial, and these are quite characteristic of magnetite, and you can see that we have this um, transition at 120 Kelvin, so the very transition, which is indicative of magnetite. As well as looking at mineralogy, we also want to look at the domain states. So for this, we obviously did our hysteresis measurements, and we can see on the day that we have pseudo single domain grains. We also want to look in more detail, so we did some fork analysis. We found that these look, these look similar to kind of single vortex or pseudo single domain behavior. And single vortex um, has, or modeling of these sorts of domain states has shown that they can retain magnetic signatures for billions of years. Therefore, we, you know, we, we think that uh, Merkison and as other people have found can, can record its signature from the early solar system. So as well as looking at our magnetic um, remnants, we also want to look at the fabric. So to do this, we looked at the anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility and also the anisotropy of magnetic remnants by looking at the, um, by measuring the anisotropy of the anhistoresic um, magnetic remnants. Um, remnants, yeah, anyway. So and we found that we have this um, oblate magnetic fabric seen in both measurements. So we have this well-defined minimum axis of anisotropy, and then we have a spread in a plane for the, for the easy axes. Um, you can see they're both quite closely aligned, the AMS and the AMR. We can also see this quantitatively by our corrected p-value, showing that we have quite a high, um, a quite a high level of anisotropy. And the t-values, which are, are close to one, which show that we have an oblate fabric. And this oblate magnetic fabric is is um, likely to be due to an impact, um, which is what we'd expect. And these values are, are quite similar to what's been seen for other CM chondrites, and also what was found in the previous study looking at Allende. We can also combine our magnetic remnants data with our fabric, and we can see that magnetic, the NRM is aligned in the easy plane of magnetic anisotropy, which was also kind of a key finding in the study and was also found in the study on Allende. So if we can, if we kind of give a quick summary of, of, of the evidence that we found, we found that we have a low paleo intensity of 0.6 micro Tesla, which is similar to, or it's, which is um, what we would expect if we had recorded the nebula field. And we've also found that we've got this oblate magnetic fabric, which is likely caused by an impact, which is aligned with the NRM. Um, so there are three different ways that this alignment could occur. The first is that we could have a pre-impact magnetization, and then during an impact, the magnetization was rotated into the plane of impact. However, the modeling has shown that these low velocity impacts would overwrite um, the magnetization that was previous. Or the magnetization could be recorded at the same time as the um, fabric, so this means that the magnetization was recorded during the impact. 
or the third type is, or the third case is that the magnetization was recorded after the impact, but this means that the growth of those magnetic grains or however the um, magnetization was acquired has to have inherited any previous fabrics. So bringing it back to trying to show if we have any evidence for an impact induced TRM, we can see that the magnetic evidence suggests that the magnetic evidence is consistent with an impact induced TRM in Murchison because we have a low paleo intensity which is within the bounds of the nebula field and we also have this oblate magnetic fabric which is aligned suggesting that they occurred or they were imparted in the same event. And now the other two additional constraints to this model are um, how does it fit into the history of Murchison. So these impacts must have happened before the nebula field dissipated which is thought to happen around six million years after the start of the solar system but there's a lot of debate around the strength and the and the longevity of, of the nebula field kind of ongoing currently. And the impacts also have to have happened after the magnetic minerals in Murchison formed. Now the magnetic minerals formed during aqueous alteration, but they've been dated as, um, so the aqueous alteration in Murchison was ongoing for quite a long time period, between two and eight million years. However, the Murchison has been dated at 2.4 million years, suggested that it's, um, it was produced early on in, in, in the history of Murchison. So we've shown that if these impacts occurred between kind of 2.5 or, or three, depending on the strength of the field, and six million years, then um, there's a, this is when these impacts could be occurring between these primitive meteorites and recording the magnetic field. So we've shown that it is possible. However, we, we have to kind of consider the alternative magnetization mechanisms that are happening in Murchison or may have happened in Murchison. So the first was whether or not Murchison could be, this magnetization could be recording the dynamo field. Now, this is um, kind of unlikely because the low paleo intensity that we have is, is at the very lowest bounds of what these um, what these core dynamos would, would, would produce. And also the CM parent body formed very early on in the solar system and is unlikely to, to have a dynamo field. So it is possible, but it's not, it's not as likely as having um, the, the impact induced TRM that I've just discussed. And then the other type of mechanism that's possible is we might have a chemical remnant magnetization because the magnetic minerals in Murchison formed during aqueous alteration. So this aqueous alteration was ongoing between two and eight million years, as I previously said. And if the so when the magnetite was formed, it could have been recording a, a CRM of the nebula field present. However, this doesn't easily explain the fact that we have this such a strong correlate or that we have this alignment of the magnetic fabric with the magnetization. So the, the, the growth of the new minerals would have to have inherited any previous fabric um, quite strongly. So kind of to summarize, um, we found this low paleo intensity, which suggests that we haven't been recording a dynamo field. And we've shown a timeline for the possibility that Murchison could have been recording an impact induced TRM, but because uh, Murchison is also, or because the magnetic minerals were formed during aqueous alteration, we, we can't discount the possibility that Murchison has actually recorded a CRM or some combination of the two. But that does require that the secondary minerals inherit this fabric. So yeah, thank you for listening and if you have any questions. So much, Evelyn. Uh, does anyone have any questions for a really interesting talk? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, great talk, Evie. So just one question, I think this is thing we always have to think about, but like with the, with the impact induced field, will it actually last long enough to be recorded by a TRM? Because as far as I know, the impact fields are very short lived, but the TRM is going to happen over kind of a few days at least, I guess. Um, so I think the so the the field isn't necessarily so the field is actually the nebula field that's been recording. So it's not it's not the field that's a, the field's not been created by the impact, but because you still have the cooling um, the cooling over ten seconds, I think that should be long enough for the you know, for the magnetic minerals to go from being super paramagnetic to, to recording the field as they cool. So they recoup, I think they can record the ambient field. Okay, so you think it's recording the nebula field, but it's, it's cooling very rapidly because of the impact. So that's the... Yeah, so the modeling, yeah. the modeling is, is, is looking at how you, through these poor, poor reducing impacts, you heat the magnetic minerals up to their Curie temperature. But then when they cool, they're recording any ambient fields at the time, which would be the nebula field in this case. Okay, and then why why is the cooling so quick if it's impact heated? Um, so it's because of this pore space mechanism. So because you have these non-porous chondrules, they act as heat sinks, so they take the heat away really quickly, which is why they're 
why it's so short lived. Cool, that's great. Thank you. That's a question. Yeah. Yeah, great talking to me. Uh, really interesting. Um, the question though is the paleo intensity values are, are very low. Uh, I mean, there's, there's been a number of studies of the what was believed to be the nebula field, paleomagnetism, and you know, um, from chondrules and that kind of thing. And they're, they're usually in tens, tens and, and even, you know, Kawe Borlina has just published one that's like a hundred micro Tesla. Uh, and something that's 0.6, um especially as, as it's been recorded quickly through this impact mechanism it, it caused it records the instantaneous nebula field which is stronger than the sort of time average value so to get those values you'd have to be sort of you know 15 to 30 astronomical units away from the sun which so I, don't I think, think is where the cms are thought to have arisen um so yeah to then comment on the actual the, the low value, even for a nebula field, that seems very low. Mm. So I think that I am, I think it's kind of also to do with the timing. So you know, if they're being recorded kind of three million years after the solar system, I think a lot of the studies have kind of seen that the nebula field has decreased quite a lot in intensity. So I think it's more to do with the fact that these are forming later than those other measurements. And also I guess yeah. a lot of these um, papers recently have been looking at the fact that the nebula field might actually not be that, um, not be particularly okay. kind of temporally it might change a lot spatially as well so i think that might be why we've got a lower value yeah, yeah, yeah. okay no that's interesting yeah yeah so i mean just to follow up on that so i was wondering because i mean we know the nebula field sort of well it's constrained to fit finish around sort of four four million years ish um but we don't know when your impact happened i mean is it possible that you acquire a nebula uh, CRM during the, the growth of magnetite that then gets partially demagnetized by impacts if the impacts happen after the dissipation of the field? Yes, that's a potential. I, I was kind of thinking that the minerals, the magnetite might or the minerals might have an initial CRM, but then that might would be overwritten during these impacts. Because you heat to such high temperatures, it may completely overwrite it. So instead of getting like two components, you would just have a, this complete TRM, which I guess if this occurred later would have a, have a lower value as well. Okay, thanks. <laughs>